Welcome to the latest Fox Williams Compliance Forum. My name is Peter Finch and I'm a partner in the Financial Services and FinTech team. Uh, also presenting with me today will be my colleague Marty. Um, hopefully, as you're all aware, we are here to talk to you today about the new FCA Consumer Duty. Um, just a bit of housekeeping, housekeeping before we get going. We have allowed uh, some time for Q&A at the end, but please do feel free um, to submit your questions via the chat function. Um, we'll keep keeping an eye on those throughout um, the webinar and we can try and answer any questions as we see them. Um, and actually, someone's just asked with a recording we for a post call and I guess it will uh, along with the slides. So, in terms of uh, what we're looking to cover today, for those, those of you who've uh, kind of read the consultation will know there's a fair amount of information in there. Um, as a result, the aim today is not to try and cover everything. I think we'd be here for, for a couple of days if we, if we did. Um, but instead, what we're really trying to kind of give you in the next hour is an overview, overview of what the proposals look like, kind of who they apply to, the FCA's expectations and approach to enforcement and kind of timings and next steps. Hopefully, uh, this will give you a flavor of what's ahead and should allow many of you to go away and start thinking about what the next steps might look like in terms of ensuring compliance in your own businesses. If there are areas you'd like to explore in more detail, uh, please do get in contact with us afterwards and we can chat through these with you. So just a bit of background before we get into kind of the main crux of the proposals. Like me, many of you will be following the progress of the consumer duty for a number of years now. Um, but despite kind of doing the rounds for this period of time, it's really only the last eight months or so that we've really got to a position where we actually have an understanding of what the rules will look like. Um, to put this into some context, I think, I think the first mention of a duty of care was made in an FCA discussion paper in 2018. And since then, we've had much debate around kind of what direction, what the direction of travel will be, what the duty should look like, and I suppose even more substantively, just how necessary it is given the existing best interest rules that currently sit in various uh, sector specific regulations, so things like import. It wasn't really until the consultation the FCA published last May we had some semblance of just how the FCA proposed to implement this. Um, although even at that stage, there were still kind of different options on the table for what the new consumer principle would look like. So things were brought into focus, however, by the, uh, the kind early Christmas present from the FCA who, who published the consultation in the start of December, or 238 pages of, of it. Um, I think I'll be pushing it to say that the consultation was welcomed uh, by the industry, but at least now I think the clarity it brings is is uh, is helpful um, and allows us, as I say, to kind of work out what the next steps might look like. So, what is the new consumer duty? I think the first thing to say and kind of make clear is that the consumer duty is really a package of measures rather than a single duty. Um, at its core, though, the FCA is proposing to introduce a new consumer principle, principle 12, that requires firms to act to deliver good outcomes for retail customers. Um, the FCA chose this formulation in favour of the second option it socialised in the first consultation, uh, that being a firm must act in the best interests of retail clients. I think feedback on, I suppose, both suggestions was mixed, although uh, the I think the feeling was that the preferred option would have been the latter. Um, alas, that's, that's not what we've ended up with. The FCA is very clear that it considers the consumer principle uh, sets a higher standard than the exist, existing principle six and seven. I think, uh, as one client described it to me, it's like principle six and seven on steroids, which I thought was, was pretty apt. Um, because of this, the West the new consumer principle applies, um, principles six and seven will be disapplied. Um, equally though, for any kind of activities falling outside the scope of uh, the consumer duty, 
principal six and seven will um, will continue to buy. The consumer principal will be underpinned by a set of cross-cutting rules that explain how firms should act to de deliver, deliver good outcomes and are kind of designed to elaborate on the FCA's expectations. Uh, the FCA is also proposing a set of four outcomes which provide an inexhaustive list of the FCA's expectations for the key elements of the uh, firm consumer relationship. Um, we'll consider each of these kind of in more detail in, in a moment. I think before we do though, there's a, there's a few things just worth calling out at this stage. Uh, the first is the F FCA has emphasized that the consumer duty does not create a fiduciary duty where one does not already exist. Um, this is something which has been raised as a point of concern over the, the various consultations. Similarly, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of made clear that the, the label consumer duty uh, does not imply a legally enforceable obligation. Um, the FCA has said it purposely branded the consumer, has purposely not branded the consumer duty as a duty of care, nor do its proposals comprise a one line duty. Kind of, as, rather, as we outlined at the start, they're a package of measures designed to tackle consumer harms and their causes more effectively. And finally, whilst, whilst many of the expectations under the consumer duty are subjective and will require firms to apply their judgment, the FCA is proposing an objective element to try and assist with this. Um, that objective element being that the new rules and guidance should be interpreted in line with a standard that could reasonably be expected of a prudent firm carrying out the same activity and related to the same product or service with a necessary understanding of the needs and characteristics of its customers. So yeah, quite a snappy one, um, but some, something to keep in mind. Just which which it should help should give some help and guidance as to kind of the level of uh, that is to be expected on firms. I think Marty is now just going to take us through scope. Yeah. So just to look in a little more detail um, at the scope of the consumer duty, and really, it's it's pretty broad. Um, First of all, the proposals are applicable to financial services and products that are provided to retail clients. There's no uniform definition of a retail client in financial services, as you know. So the scope of the consumer duty will align with the definition of retail client in each of the FCA sectoral source books. So, for example, for investment business, the scope of the consumer duty will align with the definition of retail client in COBS. Um, the scope of the consumer duty for, for insurance will follow the position in ICOBS um, and for MCOBS mortgages, the duty will apply to regulated mortgage contracts within the perimeter. So I guess the thing to note is that that's a much broader category of customers than what we typically think of as consumers. It's, it's much broader than the definition of consumer that you would normally see in consumer protection legislation. And in certain instances, it includes corporate entities like SMEs um, and also potentially some larger organizations like local authorities as well. So a pretty broad definition of consumer here. Um, the proposals obviously only apply to UK firms. Um, so to manage the risk of regulatory arbitrage, the FCA is proposing to require um, UK distributors of non-UK products to take all reasonable steps to comply with um, the product and services outcomes, which we'll go on to in a little bit more detail. So that's that's reasonably onerous, but it's just designed to make sure that you can't just make a product outside the UK and then, then sell it into the UK. Um, and the consumer duty will also apply to firms that are in the temporary permissions regime as well. Secondly, the consumer duty will apply to unregulated activities that are ancillary to a firm's regulated activities. So that's activities that are carried out in connection with a regulated activity or held out as being for the purposes of a regulated activity. Um, and authorised firms that approve financial promotions on behalf of unauthorised firms will also be captured as well. The duty will apply to prospective customers, as well as the firm's existing customer base, and it will apply to all manufacturers and distributors that have an impact on retail consumer outcomes. So that includes firms that have a material influence over the creation, development, design, issuance, operation or underwriting of a product or service. Um, and it includes firms that offer, sell, recommend, advise on, propose or provide a retail product or service. 
um, and it includes firms that prepare communications that are to be issued to retail clients. And it also can include some firms that don't have direct contact with retail clients. So, um, you know, a firm that might manufacture or supply a product or service, but isn't the, the one that actually you know, gives it to the retail client. So um, firms will only be responsible for their own activities and they won't need to see oversee the activities of other firms in the manufacturer distribution chain. But when firms work together to manufacture a product, they need to have a written agreement that sets out their mutual responsibilities. So that's quite a, a you know, an onerous obligation if there's multiple entities involved in the, in the creation of a product. Um, one of the examples that the SEA gives um, about entities that are involved in the manufacture um, but don't um, liaise directly with retail clients is the example of an investment bank that designs a structured product for sale to retail customers only. Um, and they say that that type of entity would be subject to a consumer duty, but an investment bank that provides wholesale instruments as a component part of a product that's created by a third party firm wouldn't be subject to the consumer duty. So there's there, there will be some kind of gray areas um, where you'll need to look in a bit more detail about whether or not the consumer duty will apply to you. I think um, th one of the other kind of interesting things is that this will apply on a forward-looking basis to existing products and services. So although the consumer duty will not apply, apply retroactively to firms past actions, it can apply on a forward looking basis to existing products and services that are still being sold to customers. And even to some extent to some closed products and services that are no longer being, being sold to customers. So that's another kind of way in which the scope is pretty broad and something to pay attention to. Um, and then finally, the FCA is conscious that they need to apply the framework proportionately, taking account of the firm's role in relation to the product or service, the nature of the product and service, and the characteristics of the consumers in question as well. So that's um, a quick summary of the scope. It's pretty broad. Um, I'm now going to move on to briefly outline the cross-cutting rules. So the cross-cutting rules are, are basically kind of three rules that underpin the consumer duty. And the idea behind these is to, is to try to explain how the firms, how firms should act to deliver good outcomes. And I think these rules are really designed to elaborate on the FCA's expectations. So just very briefly, um, the first cross-cutting rule is to act in good faith towards retail customers. So that's honestly fair, open dealing and acting consistently with the reasonable expectations of retail customers. So firms here can still pursue their legitimate commercial interests. Um, and like Peter said earlier, the FCA have been very clear um, that this doesn't create a fiduciary duty unless one already exists for some other reasons. So this is, is really just a, a duty to act honestly, fairly and, and openly and consistently with reasonable expectations. Um, secondly, firms need to make sure they avoid causing foreseeable harm to retail customers. Um, so there was some concern uh, after the first consultation about the use of the word foreseeable, um, particularly concerned that this actually could be very, very broad um, in that many things are foreseeable. Um, and the SEA have clarified now that this obligation will depend on the type of a product that a firm offers. Um, so a firm providing an execution only or a non-advised service can assume, unless it knows or should have known otherwise, that their customer's objectives is the use or enjoyment of the service that they have purchased. Now, the exception here is very much if it knows or should have known otherwise. So if the firm does have information to suggest that the retail customer has a different or additional financial objective, then they do have to take that information into consideration. Um, a firm providing an advisory or discretionary service does have an obligation to understand more about an individual consumer's specific objectives and needs to act on that knowledge. So I think that's, um, that's, um, very, that's a very important, um, important one. Um, firms are 
not required to protect cons consumers from unforeseeable harm. So that's helpful and or all poor outcomes. And they're also not expected to um, mitigate inherent risks that a customer has reasonably understood and accepted. So, for example, a mortgage carries a risk of repossession, investments carry a risk that the market may move. Um, so the FCA has clarified that, which I think is helpful. Um, they've, also, they've also stated that um, you need to continue to avoid causing foreseeable harm throughout the life of the product. So for example, they, the, the example that they give there is portfolio management. Um, if you're doing a kind of ongoing activity, then you need to make sure that you avoid causing foreseeable harm to retail customers on an ongoing basis. Whereas if what you're doing is execution only, um, you might just have to avoid causing foreseeable harm at a specific point in time. So they do draw the distinction between point in time and um, ongoing throughout the life cycle of a product. And then the third cross-cutting rule um, is that you need to enable and support retail customers um, to pursue their financial objectives. So we've touched on that briefly. Um, and the FCA has removed its original suggestion that firms need to take all reasonable steps to achieve the latter of these two requirements. Um, and that's really helpful because I think they're, after the initial consultation, they'd stated that they need to take all reasonable steps, which is a really very onerous obligation. Um, and the firm, uh, the FCA has now clarified that it wants firms to focus on acting reasonably um, rather on steps and processes. So that's helpful. There's no longer an obligation to take all reasonable steps um, to adhere to these second two cross-cutting rules. In addition to the cross-cutting rules, um, the FCA has also come up with four, um, a set of four good outcomes. Um, so the, as Peter already mentioned, the purpose of the consumer duty is to ensure good outcomes for consumers. Um, and these four good outcomes are not an exhaustive list, but um, the FCA does provide quite a lot of detail about them in, um, in their draft rules and guidance. Um, and so this is a kind of really good starting point um, for firms trying to work out what the consumer duty means for them in a kind of very concrete way. So the first good outcome is um, product and service governance, really. And there are different requirements for firms that depend on their role in the distribution chain. So there are requirements that apply to manufacturers, and then there are other requirements that apply to distributors. So, so kind of um, First of all, we know that there can be more than one manufacturer. So I guess the first task is to identify whether you are a manufacturer. And then very, very kind of broadly, the, the obligations that apply to manufacturers are to develop an approval process for your product or service. Um, you need to buy, identify a target market of consumers at a sufficiently granular net level, and you need to make sure that the needs, characteristics, and objectives of the product or service is compatible. Um, or sorry, the needs, characteristics, and objectives of the, of the target market is compatible with the product or service. You, you also need to consider whether there are any consumers with characteristics of vulnerability in your target market. And if there are, you need to take account of any additional or different needs of those vulnerable consumers. You then need to test the product or service to ensure that it's designed to meet the needs, characteristics, and objectives of your target market. You need to select appropriate distribution channels and provide information to your distributors that help them understand the target market. And then you also need to regularly review your product or service um, and its distribution. And then you need to take any appropriate action that's required after that review to mitigate any harm that you've identified um, that might arise. So that's kind of a fairly extensive set of obligations imposed on manufacturers there. Um, likewise, there are requirements that are imposed on distributors. So distributors need to develop distribution arrangements. Um, they need to get information from the manufacturer to understand the product or service, its target market, and its identified distribution strategy. And distributors also need to regularly review their distribution arrangements. Um, and if appropriate, they need to take action to mitigate any harm that's arisen um, or to adjust their distribution arrangements appropriately. And then I think the final thing to mention is that firms can 
be both a distributor and a manufacturer. So if the reality is that you're manufacturing and distributing, you need to take into account um, both of these sets of obligations in order to make sure that you're ensuring good outcomes in the area of governance, um, product and service governance. So um, kind of fairly onerous obligations there. The SEA have said that these things should be proportionate, um, but that, I mean, when you read the consultation and you read the rules, that's really like a bit of a side note at the end. Um, but, you know, it, it is still helpful. So the requirements are less onerous for simple products and with less risk of consumer harm. So the second good outcome is ensuring a fair price and value. Um, again, this is the, the obligations here are divided according to whether you're a manufacturer or a distributor. Um, so when you're a manufacturer, the assessment of whether the price of a product or a service is fair value has to include at least a consideration of the nature of the product and the service and the benefits that will be provided to consumers or the benefits that consumers can reasonably expect. Um, any limitations that are part of the product and service, the expected total price that consumers will pay and any characteristics of vulnerability in the target market, which characteristics of vulnerability in the target market is something that comes up again and again in the rules. It's obviously something that the SEA are very keen to emphasize. Um, and then it, it, distributors have an obligation not to distribute a product or service unless they're satisfied that their distribution arrangements are consistent with the product or service providing fair value. Um, so again, to do this, they have to have information from the manufacturer um, and they have to be confident that any remuneration that they receive as a distributor isn't um, undermining the value that a customer would receive from the product. Um, so it, it, there aren't any detailed requirements on how firms should assess fair value. There's no price caps or limits on margins or anything like that. Um, but, it does, but the guidance does make clear that firms can't rely on individual consumers' willingness to buy a product or service as evidence of fair value. And it does set out these items that manufacturers and distributors must consider in order to assess whether they are providing fair value. Um, it, one of the helpful things is that the FCA have clarified that, people, that manufacturers and distributors can now take into consideration their own costs. Um, so there was a very unhelpful suggestion in the first consultation that the focus could only be on the benefit or the value that's delivered to the consumer. Um, but the FCA has now helpfully um, and I think necessarily conceded that obviously private companies providing a product must and can take into consideration their own pro their their own costs. So that's that's helpful. Um, a few other points just to note. So um, low prices don't always mean fair value. And um, there are some non-financial items that the FCA have said are are very reasonable to consider when assessing value. So things like um, helpful customer service um, and other kind of non-financial benefits as well. So. It, it, it is about price and financial value, but there's also kind of non-financial element here as well. Um, and then FCA expects firms to regularly review their value assessments. So you can't just do this once at the outset and be done with it. You have to do this on a regular basis. Um, and um, yeah, it, there, there's a bit of flexibility here, but you kind of, you have to run through the process basically. And then I think Peter is going to go through the next two outcomes. Yeah, thanks, Marty. So the next two are consumer understanding and consumer support. Uh, starting with consumer understanding, this is arguably the most uh, onerous of all the outcomes, I would say. Um, and the reason I say that is, so I think under this, the FCA expect firms to focus much more on consumer outcomes and understanding throughout the customer journey, um, kind of their mantra being comprehension is key. So whilst uh, this means uh, firms will need to ensure communications are fair, clear, and not misleading, all, all the good stuff that everyone does um, on a daily basis, you will also need to consider your overall approach to communicating information. Um, 
so that, as the FCA describes it, you can equip customers to make effective, timely, and properly informed decisions. Um, I suppose what this means to meet this standard is that communications need to be tailored appropriately. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Communication needs to be tailored appropriately, but you also need to monitor, test, and adapt those communications on an ongoing basis to ensure that they remain um, suitable, uh, which I think is, is probably something not everyone is doing on a, on a regular basis at the moment. And query, just I suppose, how, how you go about testing and testing that and kind of satisfying yourself that they do uh, meet that required threshold. Ultimately, you sometimes will need to satisfy themselves that they've drafted communications that are reasonably likely to be understood by their target audience and perhaps even uh, equally important, be able to demonstrate this to the FCA's satisfaction. I think the other query I would have around this is really just how the FCA will, will seem to evaluate this given the uh, it's a huge range of financial products with uh, massive varying levels of complexity that the consumer duty will bite on. So as I say, I think lots, lots of food for thought in that one. The final outcome is consumer support. And this outcome focuses on firms providing an appropriate standard of support to customers so that um, the aim being that customers can use products as reasonably anticipated and do not face unreasonable barriers in doing so. Um, for the example, I think given that um, customers face unreasonable additional costs that they hadn't expected when they took out the product. Um, I think the FCA has made the point that this consumers won't be able to assess the quality of post-sale service by the time they buy the product. Um, so they're seeking to address this by setting requirements for firms and that customer service arrangements must be of a standard that meets consumers' reasonable needs and expectations. Um, so really, it should be at least as easy to enact, exit product or service as it is to purchase it in the first place. Uh, and again, query just how many uh, firms have, have, have got products set up in that, in that manner at the moment, because I, I think that will, be, that, that will require some, some changes. Under this outcome, it's, it's, it's not intended just to be limited to after sales service. Um, or kind of be the responsibility of customer service teams alone. Um, the FCA has made the point this needs to be looked at in the round. So from, from product design right up to the end of the product uh, life cycle. Um, and again, that, that in itself is probably the most onerous kind of part of this, I would say. I think a lot of, a lot of you will have uh, good customer support kind of systems in place, but I would query how much thought goes into the product design element of that um, at the outset. The, the other point to make is just that the outcome uh, must be read alongside kind of existing FCA rules around this. So things uh, such as DISP and guidance on vulnerable customers. So next, we were just gonna look at what are the FCA's expectations for what this kind of will mean for firms. I think, as it sets out on the, the top of the slide, I think the key point here is that the FCA is stressed and kind of stressed again that it, it expects to see what it describes a cultural shift in how firms focus on consumers. Um, amongst other things, I think there'll be an expectation that firms will monitor the outcomes their customers are experiencing, uh, consideration as to whether these are consistent with the consumer duty and act um, and kind of requiring firms to act when they identify issues or concerns. While the, I think the FCA is not proposing to require firms to report on specific metrics, uh, you will need to ensure, ensure that you can demonstrate effectively how you're meeting these expectations, kind of be able to explain your actions to the regulator. Um, and I think as part of that, there's, there's, there's there's a large kind of expectation that firms will be uh, producing and reviewing MI on consumer outcomes, um, albeit these, these are kind of 
the FCA has kind of conceded that these, these can be appropriate, kind of the nature and scale uh, and complexity of your business. Um, but again, I think there's probably some question marks around actually how that's going to be interpreted. I think the other point to mention here is that um, all of this also requires firm to have effective record keeping procedures um, to ensure the information can be called upon in the face of kind of requests or challenges from the FCA. Um, again, I know this is something which many firms kind of have challenges with, so it's, it's going to be something which will probably need to be addressed going forward. The, I suppose the focus on outcomes will, will probably uh, will be a concern for many of you, um, given kind of the, the requirements are highly subjective and require you to make, I suppose, for one of better of judgment calls. Um, I think the FC has kind of acknowledged this, sorry, acknowledged this, um, and that it understands that sometimes firms require, kind of, not require, kind of prefer prescriptive rules so they can actually point to something, understand what they have to comply with. Um, I think they've tried to address this through the, um, the non handbook guidance, which accompany the new rules. Um, but again, that it doesn't necessarily address that. That concern, I think, because by their very um, by their very nature, they're not they're not prescriptive. Um, I think what's probably also helpful is, is kind of uh, as Mardi alluded to, the the regulars regulators also emphasise that it does not expect firms to be able to prevent all, all poor outcomes um, or to protect customers from risks that they understand and accept. Um, again, I think there's there's a big question mark over it here, though. It's just how that will be interpreted and implied, um, especially with varying kind of levels of understanding through through customers um, and the products they're taking. And, uh, in terms of kind of further further communications from the FCA around this, they, it has said it will try and um, kind of communicate syncing through the usual supervisory and communication channels. So. Um, Things like publishing results of multi firm work, portfolio and DCO letters, speeches, and industry engagement. So I think it's, it's definitely something to keep an eye on as, as this kind of moves through the 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 timeline towards implementation, just to get a sense and feel of just how uh, what the kind of direction of travel is in terms of the regulators thinking, in terms of its expectations on firms, and how they how they. Uh, how they're going to seek to enforce it. The other question, sorry, just looking at the questions, I can look at those in a sec. The kind of the last point on um, just on this was the FCA has said that it anticipates implementation costs for firm will be, will be large. Um, this can kind of includes one off costs to implement the regime, annual costs of com compliance, and increased costs in the form of high costs and or loss of profits due to shifting behaviours. And I think this analysis alone kind of underlines just the, the level of change that the FCA is expecting firms to undertake um, in kind of the scale of the task ahead, as well as kind of potentially the fact that they, they do expect to see certain pricing levels fall. Um, yeah, query how that, query how, how and to what extent, but just an interesting point to note there. So I'm just looking at the questions. Um, yeah, so I think sorry, in the, fir the first question um, probably relates to um, the good outcome that I was discussing on price and value. So um, we've got a question. Is there anything additional that firms need to pay close consideration in respect of pricing for existing customers? Um, or are firms expected to apply price and value considerations across all customer bases? So, I mean, I guess the actual rules provide some fairly detailed um, considerations that need to be taken into account by both manufacturers and distributors when determining price and value. Um, but they do kind of flag out some general points. Um, so I think first, as we've already said, the firm cannot rely on an individual retail customer to consider whether they believe that a product provides fair value, which is um, 
very clear in the rules, but maybe not particularly helpful when you're trying to actually work out, you know, what does provide fair value. Um, the guidance says that a firm may consider one or more of the following in its assessment of whether or not a product is providing fair value, and it lists the costs incurred by the firm in manufacturing or distribution, the market rate and the charges for a comparable product provided by the firm, um, whether the firm has been able to achieve savings and benefits from economies of scale which could be shared with retail customers, and how the intended distribution arrangements support and will not adversely affect the intended value of the product. Um, the rules then go on to say that a product that has negligible or no obvious benefit will, will never provide fair value, which that bit seems kind of self-evident. Um, and then it goes on to talk about um, that the types of benefits that retail customers can reasonably expect to obtain can include non-financial benefits like enhanced customer service or providing extra assistance to certain categories of retail customers. And non-financial costs can include things like the provision of personal data and granting permission to use that data. And, and then it says that a firm needs to consider retail customers' cognitive and behavioral biases when carrying out the value assessment, which seems very involved. Um, and that where one group of retail customers is charged more for a product than another group purchasing the same product, the product is less likely to be a fair value um, if the use of differential pricing is not objectively justified. Um, but unfortunately, there's no guidance on what justifications can be given for differential pricing. But I, I guess it's helpful in a sense because it, it, it makes clear that differential pricing is acceptable and that you can charge some customers more than other customers for the same thing. But you need to be, you need to be you need to have a clear objective justification for the difference in pricing. Um, so there's no kind of. Um, I guess there's these list of additional considerations um, and, and things you should pay particular attention to. Um, but I think in a sense, this list does apply um, really across all of your customers. So these are things that you do need to consider you, you do need to consider across your entire customer base. Um, I think, they'll probably be more pertinent to some products and some customers than others, but they're, they're very general. Um, and so I think, unfortunately, there's no kind of, there's no kind of shortcut when you're applying this, um, this outcome to your existing customer base. Um, I hope that answers that first question. Um, so I think um, I on to kind of timings and next steps. Sure. Sorry, you're doing you're doing supervision and enforcement, aren't you? Let's do that. Yeah. So I was going to very quickly touch um, on supervision and enforcement. Um, so just very quickly. Um, the FCA are going to make the consumer duty an integral part of its regulatory approach. Um, so it will be built into the kind of authorization stage. And um, when a firm gets authorized, they'll need to ensure that they can show that they are um, taking the con their consumer duty into consideration. Um, firm supervision and the enforcement teams will also um, be paying attention to the new duties. So this is going to kind of filter through all of the FCA's work rather than kind of existing as a standalone regime. Um, I think the FCA is intending to use assertive supervision to intervene quickly when it identifies actual or potential harm. Um, but I guess the purpose of the consumer duty is to aim to reduce the extent to which consumers suffer harm in the first place. So I think the FCA's, FCA's idea is that over time, um, their, their need for them to intervene um, will decrease. Um, but I think given the FCA's overall approach um, and given the kind of um, way that the consultation paper has been drafted, I think we can expect the FCA to take a reasonably strict approach to supervising and enforcing the consumer duty. Um, one really helpful thing um, that 
the FCA has decided, at least at the moment, not to attach a private right of action to any aspects of the consumer duty, but it has said that it will keep this option under review. So um, I think part of the reason that it's not introducing a private right of action is to kind of give consumers, give firms time to catch up. Um, but it's also said that it will keep it under review, including in light of the evidence of firms embedding and compliance with the consumer duty. So there does seem to be a bit of a veiled threat in the consultation paper that's, um, you know, comply with this. Otherwise, we might consider whether we need to attach a private right of action to this in the future. Um, but, you know, at least that's that's helpful news for the time being that there won't be a private right of action. Um, and then just very quickly to touch on senior manager accountability. So as you know, the SMCR establishes clear senior management responsibility for compliance with regulation. And then I guess what the consumer duty does is really raise, raise that standard or raise the requirements. And um, so the SEA will hold senior managers to account if a firm fails to achieve what's required by the consumer duty. A firm's board is expected to consider a report from the firm which assesses whether it's acting to deliver good outcomes for its customers that are consistent with the consumer duty and the board's expected to do that at least annually so that's that's quite important um, and then also the individual conduct rules in Cocoon have been supplemented um, with the FCA's proposals. So there is going to be a new individual conduct rule, which will be rule six, and that will require that all conduct rules staff, including senior managers, act to deliver good outcomes for retail customers. Um, when their firm's activities fall within the scope of the consumer duty. So when that new rule applies, the existing individual conduct rule at rule four, which requires conduct rule staff to pay due regards to the interests of their customers and to treat them all fairly, won't apply. And instead this kind of more obligation, more onerous obligation of delivering good outcomes for retail customers will, will apply instead. Um, helpfully, the FCA does emphasize that the scope of a person's role and their seniority can affect the scope of their duty under the new role. So more will be expected of a senior manager than a junior member of staff. Um, and the FCA also makes clear that firms will need to provide staff with training on what their obligations will be under this new conduct rule. So that's something that we've seen um, that, that clients are starting to think about when they think about implementing um, the new consumer duty, they're starting to think about, you know, training that they'll need to give to their staff. So I think now Peter is going to go on to next steps and when, and then I'm conscious that we have some additional questions. So hopefully we'll go back to those at the end. Yep. Thanks, Marty. So in terms of kind of timelines for, for next steps, the, um, Comments on the latest consultation will close, I think, 15th of Feb, so a couple, couple of weeks. Um, and then the FCA has stated that it will plan, it is planning to publish a policy statement with final rules by the end of July of this year. Um, and the expectation is that firms will have fully implemented the requirements by 30th of April. 2023, so just over a year's time, um, which I'm sure many have been thinking is not a lot of time at all. It, it's pretty worth saying that the FCA is, however, asking for views on this time scale. So, um, as we'll kind of cover in the next in the next slide on what you should be doing now, if you do have concerns over this time scale, I would I would urge you to kind of make that clear to the F FCA as part of any response. I think the key kind of take away around all this the timings aside from kind of the end date which is kind of fast approaching is that it's been made very clear that the FCA expect firms to use the implementation period fully and to be able to demonstrate progress when asked um, the regulator has said they will monitor firms implementation during this period and the firms will need to dedicate I suppose sufficient resource and commitment to, to ensuring implementation within the required time frame. Um, 
to ensure they are strongly indicating that things cannot be left to the last minute and then it's kind of an ongoing process from now to get to implementation. So I think he brings us on to what should we be doing now? Um, and as I said, um, just, just a moment ago, I think the first thing would be is if you haven't already to respond to the consultation, um, there's still a few weeks left. Um, I think we would urge anyone who is impacted and wants to um, kind of raise concerns on what's on the requirements or timescales to, um, to make a response. Um, the FCA will, will read everything. They will, they will take note of it. I certainly can't promise you that things will change, but it's, it's better to have that in writing and kind of have those concerns um, made up front rather than um, down the line when it's too late. Next is really, I think there's kind of two key areas um, which will be a big focus for, for, for a lot of you. And the, the first, first will be kind of reevaluating the customer journey. So the FCA, as we've kind of gone through, has really clearly identified that there's more that firms can be doing to enable customers to make uh, effective financial decisions. Um, their access, Assess Act framework is again referred to in the consultation. Um, and so for firms to kind of ensure that products and services are fit for purposes, you will need to consider kind of the entire product life cycle and the way that you engage with uh, your customers at each point in turn. Um, an obvious area of focus in that will be the kind of provision of information at early stages of financial promotion and marketing, since it's, uh, it's probably these communications that really uh, provide clients with information on the product, which are used by them to assess whether a particular product kind of meets their best needs. So that certainly needs to be considered. But it's, it's not just this, it's kind of, I think kind of the emphasis from the consultation is that firms will need to, and are expected to rethink kind of the ways the information is communicated, um, thinking carefully kind of around needs of their customer base, especially vulnerable customers, um, with an kind of overarching kind of focus on the customer's best interests. Um, I think at the very least that review will require updates to T's and C's and kind of some of the marketing information we just touched upon um, before kind of products continue to be sold or renewed following implementation of the duty. I think the other point here is really the, uh, the concerns the FCA has around the development of um, kind of what they call behavioral virus biases amongst customers, um, in particular, the role uh, which sludge practices play in uh, facilitating kind of customer inertia and poor outcomes in a particular product. Um, I think what this will mean is that you'll need to interrogate your customer behavior much more rigorously than you arguably do now to understand really what the causes um, of this may be and how kind of you can put into place strategies to address them. So. Uh, either through kind of information provision or communication um, to make sure that really customers are achieving their financial objectives. The other big area of focus will be, um, as we see, kind of product governance. So as Marty touched on in the kind of the cross-cutting rules, in order to understand the application of these, you need to have, I think, obsess the potential detriment which could be suffered by your customers. And just to do, um, to, let's say, determine kind of what steps could and should be taken to, to mitigate these risks. So, whilst there is much of a debate around I suppose, the concept of fair value, um, I think it's clear that the regulator is seeking to link the costs of products and services with the benefits of which they're intended to provide. Um, so, we know retail kind of investment products are already subject to pretty granular requirements around product governance. Um, the FCA's, I suppose, expectations on other regulated products, so things like secure and unsecure lending, hasn't uh, to date been calibrated in this way, but I think we'll certainly will be going forward. Um, and so I think you're gonna need to 
kind of consider the ways in which you uh, around I suppose the expectations on value delivery and benefits can be accommodated um, within your existing kind of product governance processes and where they can't kind of make the changes needed to reflect that. Um, and then finally, I think it's kind of within this context, it's clear that it can, you're going to need to have, uh, I'd say, more regular monitoring of customer behavior and product performance to kind of satisfy yourselves that the products are achieving the outcomes um, required under the duty. And again, kind of be able to play that back to the FCA when required to do so. This kind of these areas of focus all kind of lead to, um, I suppose, the requirement for implementation projects. Um, I think that's something which should be uh, kind of the forefront of everyone's mind kind of from now onwards, really. Um, it's, I think the FCA said it, it's, it's, it sees the consumer duties requiring a higher standard for firm culture and behaviours and the firm should prepare for a period of change in the way it does business, uh, they, they do business with their customers. And I think in order to meet these expectations, um, I think you are going to need, certainly in some of the large organisations, kind of specific projects to understand the impacts of the new rules, gap analysis, um, against existing requirements to understand what changes are needed, um, depending on the kind of scale and range of products being sold. Um, this may even, you might need substreams on a product line basis to assess the individual impacts. Um, and I know easier, easier said than done, but kind of these projects need to be appropriately resourced, um, kind of given the fundament, fundamental importance to the firm in the, and its business plan and kind of just how important the FCA sees this as, as a requirement on firms going forward. The final point was just, um, given the importance of, and the necessity of kind of implementation projects and kind of the work that was required and the interplay at SMCR, um, senior buy-in at board level is going to be needed to ensure kind of the significance of this is recognised by those by those in the C-suite, um, as well as kind of the additional responsibilities on them under this. So um, I know many uh, many of you are considering this, but kind of rolling out training to senior execs is something we would we would urge as a good as a good next step to try and get that buy in at, uh, at senior level. I think um, that's everything we have to cover. Um, I think there, there are, are some, some questions. questions. Um, so maybe I'll quick out there. There's a few questions. So we'll just try and sweep um, through these relatively quickly. But obviously, um, Peter and I are available afterwards if, if anybody wants to discuss anything in more detail. Um, so one of the questions that we've had is to what degree are the cross-cutting rules applicable to investment to an investment execution platform. Execution platforms are a tool, um, but um, the cross-cutting rules suggest an onus on intervention, potentially crossing the line into advisory or discretionary activity. So that's a great question. And um, there is some guidance um, in the cross-cutting rules section that addresses that. So it says a firm that provides an execution-only service or a non-advised service can assume unless it could reasonably be expected to have known otherwise that the financial objectives of a retail customer are to purchase, use and enjoy the full benefits of the product in question. So that's basically saying that unless you have evidence to the contrary, you can assume that you can just execute it and you can assume that the, pro the customer is getting what they want. And um, there's then additional guidance that goes on to say that an example of where a firm knew or could reasonably be expected to have known um, a certain piece of information is where it's required to gather that information on the retail customer under law. So it, it includes cross-references to ICOBs, NCOBs, CONC, um, and, and a couple of provisions in COBs, which are the provisions that that set out when you need to be asking your customer for information. Um, so um, it, it's setting out the, the reference in COBS, for example, is a reference um, to the COBS section 
that um, deals with appropriateness um, and the, the information that you need to get to assess whether a product is appropriate for a customer. So um, I think it's that section is sort of reasonably helpful and is trying, I think, to make clear that um, this doesn't take an execution only service and effectively make it um, an advisory or a discretionary activity. Um, and, and I think also the reference to the sectoral handbooks is, is helpful because it's almost deferring to those. Um, I think maybe what's slightly less helpful is that it's that's an example of where a firm knew or could reasonably be expected to have known otherwise. So it leaves open for the possibility that there are other ways that a firm you know should have known better um so I guess that could put you in a difficult position where you know you just have a customer that tells you something um outside your kind of normal process and um, could you be expected to take that into consideration um I think it's unclear um and I think to the extent that that's maybe practically possible you might want to get you might want to respond to the consultation but um I think there is there is some kind of helpful guidance in there already. Um, this links slightly into one of the other questions that we've had, um, which is about appropriateness. So it's how will the current rules in COBS and appropriate slightly change with the consumer duty? Um, specifically in COBS 10.2, firms can currently allow a client to proceed with their account if they fail appropriateness, so long as the client is warned of the risks. Um, now, interestingly, that section that I was just referring to refers to COBS 10.2 and almost seems to defer to COBS 10.2. Um, but I think, to be honest, the answer is not completely clear. Um, and I think that might be one of the areas um, where it might be helpful to give feedback to the consultation, um, because I think um, it, it's not... It, it's not absolutely clear whether you would need to reject every applicant who fails an appropriateness assessment um, or whether you're still able to proceed provided that the client is warned of the risks. I, I don't think there's anything in the guidance that definitively addresses that question. So I think it's, I think it's an open question.